adjunct at KDEV and has written a lot of books on Obamacare and liberty, uh, or liberty, freedom, and uh, guns. So that's why we're here, and let's, uh, let's give it up for him. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be my first time in Macon, Professor Cole, for uh, braving the elements to come here today, and also for Taylor and Landon for having me. So I have a treat for you today. Uh, not one constitutional right, but two constitutional rights, and specifically, how 3D printed guns are protected by both the First and Second Amendments of the United States Constitution. So this perhaps is more to education than anything else. Has anyone ever actually used a 3D printer? You yeah, have, what have you made? Uh, we made a Republican elephant out of it. Uh, how, how predictable. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> so 3D printing is a way of taking an object that you design on a computer in three dimensions and turning it into a real life thing. Uh, you can create anything from a house, uh, to a car, to anything else. The same way you draw it on a piece of paper, you can draw the dimensions onto a computer. And I'll give you a brief tutorial with how 3D printing works. So if you will indulge me, and remember back to high school geometry. Does everyone remember what a cylinder is? Yes, a cylinder is like a circle that's stacked on top of each other, right? So to figure out the volume of a cylinder, you need to know two things. You need to know the height and the radius, right? The radius is like the width of the cylinder. So if I tell you to draw a cylinder of a height of 20 inches and a radius of 5, in theory, you would know what to do. If I gave you a piece of clay or a piece of stone, in theory, at least, you could chisel that out or form it into an actual object. This is exactly how 3D printing operates. You take an object, you use a computer to design it, you use plain language and graphics, and then the computer spits it out. Um, the actual process of creating 3D printing uh, is fairly straightforward, and you can create objects of all shapes and sizes. And it uses something called a 3D printer. So here they're making a race car. Um, how does a 3D printer operate? It operates in the same fashion as a candle. My candle. Now, has anyone ever made a candle? You've never made a candle? You made a candle. Yeah. Okay. So how do you make a candle? Right. You take the wick. You dip it into the wax, you dip into the wax, you lift it up, and you keep dipping it over and over again. And as you keep dipping, it keeps getting thicker and thicker around the base. 3D printing works in the exact same fashion. But instead of dipping a wick into wax, you are spraying very fine layers of plastic, one on top of the other, on top of the other. So how does it work here? Imagine you have a little nozzle with a little spray in the bottom, and you put one layer, and then you put another layer, and then you put another layer, right? Same way an old-fashioned printer works. Eventually, if you keep stacking one layer on top of another, you actually get to a ball, a sphere. And while this uh, a plastic is being sprayed down, there's a heating mechanism that makes, the, um, uh, that makes the plastic solidify. This is how 3D printing works. So I'm going to show you a demonstration of how you create an object using a 3D printer. I'm not going to tell you what's being created. I want you to shout it out when you see it, okay? You'll, you'll see it in a minute. So we start here with a very basic layer of like green goop, right? What, what the heck is that? Then another layer comes in, and sort of this honeycomb uh, uh, lattice shape. And this is actually a very strong way to build an object because it's a very strong thing of the bees. The bees know what they're doing. So we have one layer, another layer, another layer. Anyone see it? Another layer. Frog, okay, you're on the right track. Another layer. Keep going, that's it. Another layer. It's not Pepe the Frog, I'll tell you that much. Another layer. I hate crime at this point. Close. Yoda, bingo. People usually get it with this one. You guys took too long. Uh, but yeah, it, it's Yoda from Star Wars. And you can keep going. And there, there it is, right? Everyone sees it now. Okay, <laughs> well, glad you caught it. So as you keep putting layer on top of a layer, eventually you can finish the full object, and you can create very ambitious objects. Um, now, I am not artistic at all. If you'd ask me to give me a piece of clay or a piece of stone and ask me to sculpt that, I'd say, yeah, right, no way it's possible. Um, but with 3D printing, you can make a very sophisticated object very easily. So, of course, given that we're in America, what is the primary things that people want to create with a 3D printer? Guns, of course, this is why I'm here today. One of the first uh, uh, practical purposes 
the three D printing, not perhaps organs or homes or anything else. Guns, because God bless America. And the first sort of this weapon is called the Liberator. Now, earlier I showed you the way to create a cylinder using 3D printer, right? This is a barrel of a gun. And if you think about it, the barrel of a gun is a cylinder. Ah, see, there's a purpose of why I did that. Now, now you see. And this device was created by this gentleman. His name is Cody Wilson. Cody was a first-year law student at the University of Texas in 2012, and he made nationwide headlines, global headlines indeed, because he created a 3D printed pistol. Now, Cody uh, is a self-avowed anarchist. Um, he's also my client. Yes, indeed. Uh, as I'll discuss later, uh, I'm representing Cody. We've, in fact, sued the federal government for reasons I'll discuss later. Uh, 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 but he is not only a law student, but he's also an entrepreneur and paying my bills. So I'll, I'll try to be nice to him, but but we, I have a good shtick then, Pat. So how did Cody come on to the scene? The first thing he designed was this. Do you want to know what this is? Yeah, exactly. It's an AR-15 lower receiver. Now, everyone knows about the AR-15 because it's always in the news. But what people don't realize is that the guts of the gun, the thing that makes the gun work, is this little you know, frame. right? It's called the receiver. This is how all the parts of the gun fit together. And this is the only part of the AR-15 that's actually regulated by the federal government. The rest of the gun you can buy with any license or anything else. This is the part the feds have an interest in. Okay? Why is this important? Because under current law, it is perfectly legal to make your own receiver. You can go online right now in five minutes and search for an 85, I'm sorry, an 80% lower receiver. What does that mean? It's this device that's 80% complete. And all you do is drill some holes here and there and make it work. Cody found a way to print the receiver entirely using a 3D printer. And it works with hundreds of rounds. And it, it's fully functional. The second thing that made Cody famous was, was making a magazine. You can see here this little white box. A magazine is the thing the bullets go into, the easiest way to explain it. And he named this magazine the Cuomo, after the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, who tried to ban these sorts of devices. Cody has a sense of humor. But what really put Cody on the map is this. What the heck is this, right? What, what is this? These are the parts of, of the Liberator. Fully functional handgun. You think, I don't know, Josh, what am I even looking at? Well, handle, frame, springs to strike the thing, bullet, the nail is a firing pin, and your favorite cylinder, barrel. These parts, with the exception of the nail and the bullet, are created entirely from a 3D printer. And when assembled, like so, it creates a fully functional weapon. Here's what it looks like in real life. Now, if you notice, there's like a little, little rope over there. Everyone see that? Why is there a rope there? Because when Cody first started making these, he wasn't quite sure if they'd work. And when you want to pull a trigger of an untested gun, you do it with a rope and you stand very, very far away, lest it blow up in your hand. But after several rounds of trial, Cody was able to get it strong enough. The actual barrel has to be treated with this acetone vinegar bath to make it hard enough to absorb the combustion and so it doesn't blow up in your hand. Uh, but eventually, Cody was able to make it fully functional. And here he is posing for the, uh, the press. Uh, the general rule is never point a gun at anyone. He did not follow this rule. So is there a problem? Did Cody do anything illegal by making this 3D printed gun? Like, why does he need a lawyer? When I talk about 3D printed guns, this is the image that comes to mind, right? That, that you have an inkjet printer and you press print and boom, a fully, a fully functional Glock pops out. Um, I hope today to disabuse you of that notion. That is not how the technology works. It's fanciful. Um, uh, you cannot push a button and have a gun right there. The other notion that I want to disabuse you of is that Cody invented homemade guns. It's simply not the case. So does everyone know what a zip gun is? A zip gun. George, you're not doing well for me today. A, a zip gun is a homemade gun. Since, I don't know, forever, people have been able to make guns using homemade devices. This is a soldering iron combined with a garden hose nozzle. $5 in parts to the hardware store. Functional gun. 
All you need to make a gun is something sharp to strike the back of a bullet and some sort of tube for the bullet to fly out of. I was Googling around the internet, I found these also. These are the little flashlight keychains, right? You've seen them around. They were repurposed to become a gun. All you do is you jam it right back in there. I now want to show you a clip of how you can make a rifle out of a piece of rubber tubing, a metal pipe, and a single shotgun shell. Okay? Do not try this at home. These guys are idiots. And you'll realize why they're idiots in a few minutes. Okay? So how does this work? At the end of this metal pipe is this little dimple, right? The idea is if you load the shotgun shell into this rubber tube and you take this metal pipe and you slide it in and then you go jam, it will make a fully functional rifle. So everyone look right here. What is problematic about this person's firing range? Anyone see it? Anyone see the problem? Up here. What's that? Electrical wires, yes. So he's shooting into a box inches from electrical wires. In the next shot, you see even more clearly. There's an outlet right there, and he's firing a gun right into this thing. Again, I told you, do not, I repeat, do not try this at home. These guys are idiots. But what happens is you take the pipe and jam it together. Ready? One, two, three, boom. He made a gun. It is so cheap and easy to make a single shot gun. Idiots with a piece of rubber tubing and a pipe can make it. And look how proud they are, the little you know, smoke coming out of their, of, 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 their, of their little homemade gun. So again, I'll ask, did these idiots break any federal law? I'm going to put aside state law for a minute because state law varies wildly. But in Georgia, at least, did he violate any federal law? The answer is no. Our good friend at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the favorite convenience store, um, they ruled and they've said that as long as you make a gun for personal use and it doesn't enter interstate commerce, which is a term of art, remember from Conla, right? There's no commercial transaction. If you make a gun for your personal use, there's jurisdiction over it. This has been their long-standing policy for many years. So as long as you're not selling the gun or giving it to someone else, it's not under federal jurisdiction, right? You can make your own gun using $5 in parts from the hardware store, and you can be an idiot. So what's the problem then, right? Why is, why is Cody in the need to hire an attorney, right? What did he do that became such a big deal? Where Cody drew the attention of the feds was not simply the fact that he made these guns himself. Cody drew the attention of the feds because he put the blueprints, the CAD, these sort of CAD files, on the internet for global distribution. Shortly after Cody put these files on the internet, he received a letter in the mail from the State Department. And the State Department charged him with illegal export of arms. Cody said, wait a minute. I am not shipping arms overseas. I'm putting a file on the internet. The government said, no. Putting technical data of how to make firearms on the internet is the equivalent of literally mailing a gun overseas. Take down your files, the government said. It was on this basis that Cody filed a lawsuit against the US government, saying that they violated his First Amendment rights and his Second Amendment rights. So the paper I shared with Professor Cole was actually a precursor to the litigation. I wrote this paper in 2013 or 14, and then one day I had a really good phone call from Cody. And Cody's like, I want to hire you as my lawyer. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, I want to sue the government. I'm going to hire as a lawyer. So if anyone ever tells you scholarship doesn't get you a job, well, it did here. I'm not paying much, though. It's, it's, it's out of the heart, right? But Cody brought suit arguing that this violates both the First and Second Amendment. So I want to walk you through these constitutional arguments and how these work. So as you know, the basis of the First Amendment is the government cannot impose a content-based restriction unless they have a very good reason. The government can't impose a prior restraint of speech unless they have a really, really good reason. And in the history of the court, 
not many reasons have sufficed to meet this barrier, which is called strict scrutiny. What we have here is a content-based regulation. Because the content of these communications involves how to make a gun, we have content-based regulation. Now you may say, wait a minute, Josh. These are you know, not like political speech or art or music. Um, Cody's making designs of how to make a dangerous gun. Right, you can't use speech to facilitate crime. Well, there's an old book, which you may be familiar with, called The Anarchist Cookbook. Does anyone know about this book? The Anarchist Cookbook was this book published in the 60s and 70s uh, that basically taught you how to be a domestic terrorist. Taught you how to make bombs, how to make explosives, how to make poisons, how to do all these things that could really make mischief. And the government tried, oh, they tried, to ban this book. To get it taken, there was no Amazon back then, right? But they wanted to try and ban it and get it off the bookshelves. And the court after court said, no. Merely publishing a book that discusses how to do stuff is not some sort of imminent incitement of violence, right? It's far too attenuated. So the court said, even though speech can be used in a dangerous manner, it's still protected. They say, wait a minute, Josh, we're not, we're not talking about a book here, right? We're talking about you know data. Well, my friends, information is speech. And the court, uh, I think to their credit, has been pretty consistent on explaining that the doctrines of the First Amendment apply equally, whether we're talking about a physical book or we're talking about information on the internet. In a case called Sorrell v. IMS Health from 2011, the court held that the creation and dissemination of information are speech. Both, not just creating it, but sharing it, is encumbered within the, sorry, is encompassed within the First Amendment. Um, uh, during the arguments we had in the Fifth Circuit, I'll talk about the litigation in a bit, but one of the judges during the arguments in the Fifth Circuit raised a question saying, well, what if instead of putting these files on the internet, Cody had put this on the library in Houston, Texas, where you have people from all over the world walking in, you don't need to show a passport to enter a library. Could the government then ban that book? And frankly, the consequence of the government's position is, yeah, we could ban that book. When your position for the government is we can ban books, you need to rethink your position. So that's the First Amendment, right? We live in this world surrounded by data. What about the Second Amendment? The Second Amendment provides, as I'm sure you all know, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In a 2008 case called District of Columbia v. Heller, the Supreme Court held by a 5-4 to four margin that Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Nothing to do with the militia service. And they struck down the District of Columbia's handgun ban. A couple years later, in a case called McDonald v. City of Chicago, the court held that the right to bear arms was incorporated or extended to the states, right? So now the cities or states can no longer ban uh, uh, handguns. And this is a cool picture of McDonald and Heller shaking hands, or bearing arms, I suppose you could say. Um, this was the last time the Supreme Court granted certiorari in a Second Amendment case, was in 2010. Um, since Heller, the court basically denied certiorari on every single Second Amendment case, which was frustrating me for quite some time. And now that Justice Scalia is no longer here, uh, uh, it could potentially be uh, a danger to the court to take a Second Amendment case again, because it may go the other way. But in the absence of any precedent from the court, um, the lower courts have kind of been all over the map. And some courts have held theirs strict scrutiny, some courts have held this intermediate scrutiny, and they've really not been consistent with how they've interpreted the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court has shown no interest in unifying those precedents. But I want to walk you through um, two attributes of the Second Amendment that I think are relevant here. And the first is what I call a right to acquire arms. What do I mean by this? I am not saying, and please follow me, I am not saying that the government can make no regulation of who can buy and sell arms. That's not my point at all. My point is rather that if we have a right to bear arms, we have to get the gun from somewhere. Imagine a world where the government said, okay, you can own a gun, but you can't buy one. Okay, where am I supposed to get a gun from? Or you can read books, but you can't buy a book. Or you can have an abortion, but you can't sell abortion. You pick whatever example you want. Um, as a necessary consequence to own a gun, you need to get it from somewhere. And today, the primary, if not virtually exclusive, method of obtaining a gun is buying one. Um, I'm indeed, uh, uh, Dick Heller, who I mentioned before, he actually had a handgun in his possession from before the District of Columbia's ban went into effect. 
after the case, he was allowed to get a license, and now he could buy a gun and actually exercise his Second Amendment right. So I think you do have this right to acquire guns. Certainly it can be uh, regulated. I don't, I don't make that point. That's some sort of absolute right. But the point is there can't be a flat-up prohibition on acquiring arms. Okay. Second, and this one I'm, I'm a much more solid ground, you have the right to make your own gun. Now, I mentioned before that under the alcohol, tobacco, and fire and regs, homemade guns that are not in commerce are entirely uh, uh, legal. Um, machine guns, different story, but, but for, for one-shot sort of semi-automatic guns, you can make your own. And there's historical pedigree here, right? Going back to the time of the American Revolution, there was no Cabela's, there was no Dick Sporting Goods, there was no Bass Pro Shops. If you wanted a gun, you made it yourself. That's why they weren't very effective. Um, indeed, if you ever watch the John Adams miniseries, there's this great scene uh, where Abigail Adams is pouring lead balls for the, for the uh, a militiaman in Massachusetts. So long before we could even acquire a gun for sale, people were making their arms. And I think collectively you have this right to make arms. So why is this important? The government cannot impose a flat-out ban on 3D printed guns because it implicates not only the right to bear arms, but also the right to acquire arms and information about them, and also the right to make your own arms. So on multiple fronts, I think this runs afoul of the Second Amendment, a flat-out ban. But wait, I'm not done. There's even more. We have a hybrid case, and you may not have seen this, but there's a principle in constitutional law that when one right reinforces another, judicial scrutiny gets stronger. I'll give you an easy example. What if the government passed a law making it a crime to say Merry Christmas? You know, the so-called War on Christmas. Imagine if there actually was one, right? The law says it's illegal now to say Merry Christmas. Is that a violation of free speech? Or is that a violation of free exercise? A little bit of country, a little bit of rock and roll, maybe a little bit of both, right? What if I told you that the, the state passed a law prohibiting the sale of books that describe how to perform an abortion? Describing how to perform abortions are now illegal. Oh, is that a violation of free speech? Or is that a violation of the 14th Amendment's uh, protection for abortion? A little bit of both. We're talking here about a similar aspect. What the government is prohibiting is people sharing information of how to make a gun. So imagine totally apart from Cody's case, right? Totally apart from Cody's case, you're a, you're a sharpshooter for the Olympics, right? And you've discovered a way to, to tune the rifle in a certain way to get more accuracy on a shot. And you decide to put those specifications on the internet. Under the government's reading, you've now just engaged in arms control export, right? You've just exported arms because you've taught people how to make a different type of scope on a rifle to be more accurate. You cannot censor people from talking about their constitutional rights. In my remaining time, I'd like to discuss what the laws that are on the books now govern 3D printed guns and what sort of laws might pop up in the future. So the only law on the books now concerning 3D printed guns is what's called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was passed in 1988, and it says that all guns must have a certain quantity of metal in them, right? enough to trigger a metal detector. Um, why was this law passed? Because of the Glock handgun. Now, they wonder what a Glock handgun is. Um, this gun was first made famous in the Die Hard movie from the 1980s with Bruce Willis. And there's this one scene in the movie where he says, my favorite, Luggage that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x machines here, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Everything he said was incorrect, okay? There is no Glock 7. It's not made of porcelain. It's made of metal. It's not made in Germany. It's made in Austria. It will show up on an x-ray machine, and they're fairly affordable. So the entire panic of why we have this law is because a bunch of senators watch a Bruce Willis movie. Welcome to Congress, right? This is how they, this is how, this is how they set public policy, what, what's in the movies. Uh, but in any event, this law exists. So the Liberator, the one that Cody designed, has a block of metal that's soldered into the frame, enough to trigger a metal deck. Now, if you're answering the questions, I'll answer it now. If you remove the metal, will the gun be fully functional? Absolutely, it will. Uh, uh, is that problematic? Um, not Cody's problem. If you alter a legal gun, you can make an illegal gun fairly easily. You can buy a shotgun, saw off the barrel, make it a short barrel shotgun. You can take a semi-automatic gun, mix it up, make it to an automatic gun. So the mere fact that you can alter a gun after the fact is not attributable back to the creator under long-standing principles of, uh, of firearm law. Now, what about 
banning 3D guns more generally. So Senator Schumer of New York, who loves standing next to signs of things he wants to ban, uh, uh, said that we need to extend the Untechnical Firearms Act that says any gun may have plastic, even if there's a piece of metal in it, cannot be allowed. Uh, that bill failed in Congress. Congress doesn't really pass bills too often nowadays. So perhaps another way is, well, you know, we need to get rid of these 3D guns as a scourge. Uh, let's ban plastic, right? Let's ban the plastic used to make 3D guns. Uh, I have a surprise for you. Now think of the Terminator, right? You can actually 3D print a steel gun. This is a 1911 handgun made entirely from a 3D printer. I held it in my hand. It's got good weight, good balance. It felt solid. Um, so you cannot really get rid of these. Another aspect that may be relevant involves intellectual property, right? Does everyone know what DRM is, digital rights management? When you buy a song on iTunes or, or, or if you buy a book on Amazon Kindle, you don't actually own the material. You're merely signing a license to it, right? You're licensing that material. Um, the reason why is because the owner of the intellectual property doesn't want to give it to you clean, right? They want to keep a residual from it. The next biggest fear in manufacturing involves 3D printing. Why? Take an easy example. Michael Jordan's new sneakers, right? They cost what, two, three hundred dollars? The parts to make it cost what, maybe three, four dollars in some Malaysian sweatshop, right? If you could make on your home 3D printer the newest pair of Michael Jordan sneakers, would anyone ever buy them in the stores? No. The manufacturers are petrified. This isn't about downloading a movie or downloading a song, right? You can actually download a pair of sneakers or download the you know, a pair of jeans or whatever you want to make. This will put textile manufacturers out of business. Because what they're doing is not very intensive, and you can have a printer make it. So why is this relevant? Well, Professor Kidd, who's my favorite law and economics person at, at Mercer, uh, will tell you this is a case of Baptists and bootleggers, right? What are the Baptists and bootleggers? During Prohibition, oh, by the way, do they have dry counties in Georgia? Uh, so if you ever go to a dry county, you know what you're going to find the county line? A liquor store. Do you know why that's there? Let's get all the money, right? Do you know why counties are still dry? Because of that liquor store on the border, right? They lobby, or excuse the phrase, rent seek, right? They lobby to keep that dry band in place, that way they have a monopoly on sales. Okay, so during Prohibition, which were the groups that were most in favor of it? We had the Baptists, right? To get rid of the, uh, the scourge of alcohol because the Bible says so. Okay, they have these good, holy motivations. And then you have the bootleggers, right? Why do they want Prohibition? Because they make more money. They can charge a lot more for their moonshine if it's illegal than once prohibition's gotten rid of. So a similar dynamic prevails here with 3D printing. So who are the Baptists? Kanye West. True. Um, you're going to have these manufacturers who want to preserve their intellectual property. And the way they'll do it is like this. They will install a filter on your 3D printer. So if you try to print a pair of Michael Jordan sneakers, it won't work. They'll say, eh, 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 error. Has anyone, anyone ever tried making a copy of a piece of US currency on a, on a very high quality copy machine? You are all more honest than I am. It won't work. If you put a $100 bill on a Xerox, really high quality color copier, spit in an error message. There are certain signatures on the bill, which you can't see, but the copy machine can, that they worked out with the Treasury Department. It blocks printing of currency. You could have a similar filter on a 3D printer that if you try and print a pair of Kanye West sneakers, it will not work. Oh, but by the way, right? Once you get that filter in there, what else can they limit? Guns. Right? Once you let the government put filters on the objects they used to print, you know, they used to be called printing presses, but now they're called 3D printers, you can actually control what's being created. So if you want to print something that looks like a gun, it'll say, sorry, no can do. Of course, you can hack this in five seconds. It's not very meaningful, but this could be a way of clamping down on uh, intellectual property issues as well as gun issues. Now I want to go back to where I started from, the case involving Cody. The way they went after him was not because if he was actually making these guns, but because he was putting the blueprints for them on the internet. And they said he ran a file something called ITAR, which is the International Traffic and Arms Regulation. This is a fairly um, a rigorous set of, of, reg of regs that were designed during the Cold War to prevent, you know, Americans from shipping to the third world and to the Soviet enclaves, you know, weapons. Um, it made sense not to send to Afghanistan in 1981 
uh, uh, plans of how to make a stinger missile, right? That, 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 I think, that thing makes sense. But the government has interpreted this not only to apply to actual weapons, but what's called technical data about weapons. And here's where we run into the First Amendment head on. Um, if I make a cryptography book, and the back of the book I put a CD-ROM. Remember what a CD-ROM is, right? It's little round things. One day I'll say what those things are. Um, if I want to put a CD-ROM with some code of cryptography in the book, I need to get the government's permission. And they may say, no, you can't ship this to the United Kingdom. It's too dangerous. So the government has actually interpreted this regime to restrict not only physical weapons, but also data about them, which brings us to this. In May of 2013, a little bit almost uh, three and a half years ago, um, Cody gets this uh, uh, letter in the mail from the State Department, much to his surprise. Um, you know, all he did was put stuff on the internet. You guys probably put stuff on the internet every five seconds. Don't think anything about it. It said, Dear Mr. Wilson, right, we've noticed that you put a pistol on the internet. Cody said, Wait a minute, I didn't put a pistol on the internet. A, a jam a gun into the USB jack. I mean, how's that even possible, right? He put the files of how to make these devices onto the internet. And they said, until the government determines that you can do this, you need to remove from public access immediately. That means right away. Cody, to his credit, took everything down right away, which was the smart thing to do. You guys are not lawyers yet, but the number one rule of being a lawyer is don't let your client go to jail, right? Unless, unless you're trying to get into jail, which is sometimes the case. But he uh, took the files down, and there was no prosecution. After he took these files down, he put in a request, as they said, files on the internet. The request was sitting for nearly two years without a response. No response whatsoever. No response it is until we sued them. So I represent Mr. Wilson, as well as uh, Alan Gurr, who brought the Second Amendment cases in Heller. And we sued for violation of the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. A lot more less sexy stuff involving administrative law, because they are totally ultra virus. They're, they're way beyond the scope of the jurisdiction. Um, we filed this suit in uh, 2015 in district court. The district court denied the preliminary injunction. We appealed to the Fifth Circuit. And, and actually, it's funny, I was giving a talk on this topic in Indiana two weeks ago. As I was giving the talk, the court ruled against us. So that, that, that was a nice closing of the talk. Um, but the way they ruled against us was actually quite narrow. It was a 2 1 split. And the majority basically said, we're not looking at the merits, but balancing the harms, we think that the district court did not abuse its discretion. That was the entirety of the analysis. Uh, it was as narrow as possible. They did not want to look at the merits, perhaps on a preliminary injunction, maybe later. Um, Judge Jones uh, uh, wrote a 40-page dissent. Uh, nothing but the Second Amendment, just First Amendment, saying that this is serious, right? For the government to impose a prior restraint on speech, an articulated uh, 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 national harm concern, they've been very vague about what they're worried about. Um, uh, I won't go into more detail what our strategy is, but you can imagine when you lose for the Court of Appeals, there's, there's stuff that comes after that, and uh, you'll probably see what comes after that soon enough. But I maintain that not only is this bad under various principles of ministry of law, which it is, uh, there's also constitutional doubts here. Um, I'll stop here and turn to my good friend, Professor Cole, and I welcome the questions from each and every one of you, which is probably possible. Thank you all so much. Well, what's the next year? Uh, the case you were just talking about, your case, is that a preliminary injunction that you lost? They denied the preliminary injunction, yeah. So, okay, so you're still at the hearing. On the injunction. Uh, well, stuff happens before that, but yeah. Well, okay. It's not over. It ain't over until it's over. No, it is not over until it's over. Well, I think it's really interesting, and your article's interesting. Is, um, you know, going back to Heller was a really, I think it was a funny decision, although dealing with weapons maybe it shouldn't be called funny. But with, you know, five to four, the conservative. Republican justices straining to interpret a fairly clear sentence, reinterpret it to include this personal right. And so it's pretty unstable with the, you know, this election coming up. Um, I think we'll really kind of define what this country is. You know, it's a kind of big choice coming up. But if the Democrats, is there an election coming up? I, didn't, yeah. I, I haven't heard much on News to me. But, um, you know, so Heller is pretty unstable, but I don't think it's in a lot of 
peril because, of, as you said, the lower courts have just, I don't know, like two, I'm, I'm not the expert, Josh is, but a couple hundred cases have been brought after Heller and the district courts pretty much say, no, those, those laws are okay. They don't violate second. So, so um, yes, um, yes. I guess what I'm going to tell you is the Democrats win and we get a uh, Mayor Garland or somebody on the left side appointed, um, then I would doubt that they'd overrule Heller, but I could see them saying, oh, yeah, it's okay to ban making 3D guns under some rationale that they make up. You know? So that's. Jerry, Josh is making an, an argument on his side, and I think it's really interesting and good one. Whether the court is going to go that way is another question to me. And then, of course, you, I guess you kind of feel it necessary, would it be fair to say, to bring in the first and second? Oh, we lead with the First Amendment. That's our leading argument. Okay, yeah, because that may be enough, right? More than our second, well, to you. <laughs> Uh, and the second, as you say, buttresses that. Yeah. But what um, is it not? I'm just a couple of questions of curiosity. You had a nail in the liberator. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be a metal discharge thing? Um, you can't make a plastic. Right. So, I mean, here's the silly part, right? Bullets are made out of metal. Do they have to be? You can have a plastic bullet, it won't pierce the skin. Okay. Uh, the, the cops okay. actually use plastic over bullets as a riot control technique. Uh, they won't actually break skin. Okay. Okay. It'll hurt. It'll stun. Yeah. yeah. Um, you could pro a firing pin nailing other metal probably wouldn't work. I mean, maybe you could have a hardened polymer, but it's got to strike really hard yeah. on a piece of metal. And if you have a plastic, it's metal, it's going to break. So, I mean, even though the guns are made of plastic, the stuff needed to make it work are metal and they can be detected. In fact, the TSA, they have a blog, you know, and about a week or two ago, they, they put on the TSA blog that someone tried bringing a plastic gun onto a plane. Unsurprisingly, they caught it because it looks like a gun on the X-ray machine, you know, the, the, the magnetometer. So, so these are these are extremely detectable. These are not undetectable, even if uh, the gun's all plus. Yeah. The, so, um, you know, this is kind of a futuristic look. Oh, there you go. Yes, you go. But if we look into the future, seeing how this affects your argument, in which they can you can make these things mm -hmm. cheap, you know, ten bucks and effective. I mean. From your article, and the little I glean from it is a lot of the early ones, especially could maybe fire once and kind of fall apart, but they're getting better, right? So let's look in the future where you can actually make these things at home, uh, equivalent to a block, let's say. And right now, you were saying it's pretty expensive to do it if you want to, but what if it got cheaper than buying a gun? Would that change your argument, you think, or would you still have that? First Amendment right and second. Um, not really. Um, I can make my home right now a revolver using metal in the workshop, right? I'm not handy, right? I can't actually do that. This is simply a substitute for long existing technology. Um, do you know what a CNC mill is? No. A CNC mill is imagine like a machine shop, right? Where you kind of have like a drill and you move a hand like here and there to make an object. For decades, you've been able to put in your computer the cord and say, okay, move the drill here, move it here, move it here, move it here. That's existed for decades. And even before 3D printing, you can use that to drill up parts of the gun. Um, so it's really a difference in kind. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a difference in degree, not in kind. Uh, and I don't think it really makes much of a difference. Um, to, and, and I think they probably could. Uh, well, I should say that. California has passed a law that says you cannot own a gun unless it, it's licensed. If you try and make your own gun and it's not on this pre approved list of firearms, then it's illegal. That would probably be a more narrowly tailored way of doing this than, than punishing people who put stuff on the internet. Right? The question is not here is whether uh, uh, this can be stopped. I think California's law is foolish because people can they ignore it very easily. But you can go at this problem in more narrowly tailored ways without censoring speech. Do you think that it would be unconstitutional to uh, ban homemade guns? I mean, it's never been decided. It's a, it's I, a I, legislative I, policy. Well, now. I mean, if, if it's a federal law, I don't think I think I don't think 
Commerce Clause, but I don't think they would have jurisdiction over a totally homemade gun, but it's saying a state wanted to ban it, um, I think there would be problems there as well. Uh, there's a long time tradition of making a firearm. I think it'd be problematic. The California law um, probably be upheld because the courts don't give much teeth to the Second Amendment, but I, I do think it's problematic. Questions? So your client wasn't, and you just put this on the down and anybody to see it to sell information. Mm -hmm. No, the, no, in fact, everything was free and open source. Uh, there's an important point is these guns were not patented, right? If he had put on the internet the blueprints for Glock 19, Glock would suit him in five seconds to take, take that down. He made these guns open source for free. There's no commercial sales. I think he may have had some advertising on his web page and whatever, you know, banner ads and clicks for, for that, but the guns, everything was, 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 was uh, uh, totally free. I think it was a 22, something very small. It's a very, I mean, the bullet was teeny. Um, the reason why is that the plastic couldn't handle anything much stronger than that. That was leading to my next question. Does he have the technology to fabricate something stronger? So, yeah, what, what, what's interesting is since, since Cody put this stuff on the internet, other people innovated. So, even though Cody's right now under an order not to put the Liberator stuff on the web, other people have made you know, revolvers and multiple shotguns that are much stronger. They're, they're able to put their stuff on the internet. But the government hasn't gone after them, they've only gone after Cody. Using a 3D printer? Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if you took the right movie because I was reading the paper, I was thinking of. Uh, Line of fire, yep, that too. With John Malkovich, mm -hmm. and like with that one, like although you can see it in the whole body scan, like even some metal bislane can show up in on metal detector, that kind of stuff, yeah. Like, but even if you don't have the body scan, like, couldn't you go somewhere where they just bond you? Like, I guess I was trying to think of you know, it might be well, since unconstitutional, it could be more of a policy issue that they're trying to push, and especially if, like, like you said, they can get more, more. Creative ways to use uh, Again, if, if Congress wants to criminalize a plastic gun, they can criminalize the possession of a plastic gun. The question I'm talking about is, can they uh, prohibit putting those files on the internet? Right? There's a, there's a threshold question. What they went after Cody was not for possession of this firearm, which, which complies with the Gun Safe Firearms Act, but whether they can prohibit it from speaking about it on the internet. Um, and as the Clint Eastwood movie showed, that was a movie from the 80s, I think. We've had plastic guns for a very long time. Uh, it's not that hard to make one. You don't need a 3D printer to do it. This stuff's been around for a while. Well, then that was going to be my next question. Was, I just lost it. Give me a second. I'll come back. Is there a certain type of information that you think should be restricted by the Constitution? Is there a line for this? Like a better term, weapons technology, like missile, or at what point do you draw that line? Well, well, here actually, the Second Amendment does some lifting, right? In Heller, the court held that a handgun is a quintessential weapon of self defense. Here, Cody's using a handgun, a one shot pistol. Um, certain types of classified material, for example, hydrogen bombs, there's actually a lot of litigation about this. The courts held the First Amendment does not protect that sort of information. So we would not be making that claim. But here, this is a perfectly lawful handgun to own, protected by Heller, worth in the core of the right. Um, but more broadly, um, the court has laid down a number of precedents involving the First Amendment. If they want to censor speech, they have to have a damn good reason. In the case I'm thinking of the Pentagon Papers case. This was a case from the 1970s where the New York Times had published this report, which discusses the, uh, uh, the, the war in Vietnam and various lies the government told people. Um, the government went to the courts and asked for an injunction saying stop the publication of this newspaper, which is a really big deal if you think about it. And the court, I think it was a 72 or 63 vote, ruled that no, you can't do that. And in one of the opinions, I think it was by Justice White or Stewart, he said, if you want to restrict information on the basis of national security, you have to be specific. You have to tell the court, okay, here is a specific thing we're trying to stop, right? You can't just say we have a general interest in security because, you know, whatever our, our national interest is. That, that is not enough. Um, here, they've articulated no specific reason why this liberator gun poses any threat. Um, the world is a washing guns, a washing guns. Um, uh, even our own government sells guns to the bad guys sometimes. Um, yeah, I was thinking that they, didn't they seem 
quiet when you ask them about zip, zip guns. They're not around much anymore. Their guns are so cheap. I can go, I mean, I don't know, make them. I go to Atlanta. I can walk around for five minutes, I can get a gun for pretty cheap on the street. I'm sure making somewhere as well. The other, the progressive magazine case is relevant too. Oh, yes. yeah. uh, some guy, amateur scientist, came up with the uh, how to build a hydrogen bomb. And not only that, but the way that the United States triggers them, okay? And Progressive Magazine was going to publish that. Of course, the federal government waste ends it. Can publish that. It's crazy. Um, and uh, the bottom line is it never reached the Supreme Court because uh, all the magazines and papers, oh, yeah, we can. Here you go. And they still published it. And it's like moved by that time. So it never really went to the Supreme Court to say, oh, you can stop that. But that is a prior restraint, as Jeff said, and that is you really got to do something to get, you know, other than, uh, and is this case you're talking about, they're, they're after him because it went overseas? Is that, they're using that law? Or well, it, it's not overseas, but non-U.S. persons, right? The way the law is drafted is if this information is shared with a non-U.S. person, non-U.S. So even if you have a person in the United States who's not a U.S. citizen, he can't see this information. That's why the judge raised the example of what would have happened if Cody and Seth put this in a, on the internet, put it in a book in the library, and some immigrant off the street walks in, not a US citizen, walks into the bookstore, the library, and reads it. Could the government then take that book off the shelves? And their answer, and the attorney bobbed and weaved, but the answer has to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's no way of getting around it. So this is, so the law is US citizens? The phrase is non-U.S. persons, so so even lawful permanent residents are not, not allowed to see it. Really? Yeah, it's extremely strict. In fact, uh, sometimes course, if you put it on the internet, it's going overseas. Well, there's, there's a difference with respect to intent and mens rea. Putting a file on the internet versus emailing it to a foreign national actually through different acts. Um, the effect may be the same, but with the First Amendment, it requires a very specific intent. Um, there's a case called Holder versus Pantheon Law Project, which involves giving material support to terrorism, right? Yeah, that's a strange case. Yeah, it's, a, it's an odd case, but the crux of that case is they need an intent requirement, right? They have to show the person intended to provide intent, I'm sorry, intended to provide support to this terrorist group. Merely putting general information on the internet will not cut it for the strict requirements of the First Amendment. So Cody did not have the intent to the foreign national. Mm -hmm. The government actually said, well, maybe, you know, Cody puts these files on the internet, some foreign militia can download these gun files and assassinate a world leader. It's like, come on, give me a break, right? It's a, come on, give, give me a break. This is insane. It's just so attenuated. This is not going to close to justifying the prior restraint. It isn't the government argument. Not exactly a clear and present danger. Not even close. Other questions? Yeah. So, with ITAR, is there a scenario where you think ITAR would apply to one of these designs, or how does it contrast with the other? Right. So uh, it's a good question. So without going too much into the weeds of ITAR, for nearly 30 years, the Office of Legal Counsel, which is like the constitutional advisor in the Justice Department, took the position that ITAR cannot be applied to speech. And you have memos from people like Ted Olson of all the way back to the 1980s saying, if you apply this to speech, it raises constitutional doubts. Give another example. After the Oklahoma City bombing, the, uh, uh, the government, uh, the senators requested can we ban posts on the internet ways to make nitrogen bombs? Or McVeigh made a bomb out of basically fertilizer, right? And, and, and the DOJ said, um, no, you can't ban putting on the internet information to make a nitrogen bomb, uh, a bomb out of uh, you know, fertilizer. Um, the DOJ and the State Department took this position consistently until Cody. Cody is the first case where they've actually now adopted this thing where they can't regulate information. In fact, about a week before they filed their motion to dismiss in our case, they proposed a rule which effectively codifies this position that they can regulate speech. For decades, DOJ said, we can't do this, we can't do this, and it was never enforced, right? They danced around in a few cases of encryption, but they said, we can't apply it for speech like this. Our case, they changed a 30-year-old position, so we cannot do this. Um, uh, and, I think and the theory was, what, heightened scrutiny? National security. The theory, then they try to say, well, we've actually held this position all along, which they did. They, they, they try to say, well, there was this footnote in this circular in 1984 which said we could do this, even though they've actually disavowed that footnote. And now they're saying, oh, we never actually disavowed it. What are those deals? Like, this is the thing where a state department bureaucrat put out this little circular, and then DOJ said, what are you guys insane? You can't do that. 
But they finally came back and said, oh no, we actually meant that. And now that DOJ is litigating this, this is now the US government's position. I think they're holding on to it tight. Um, I, I think in future court well, proceedings. I mean, what is the government's position? Is there is a First Amendment right, but the, they can meet the scrutiny level? Or are they trying to say? They are, they, they've actually argued they can meet strict scrutiny, but they argue okay. that it doesn't apply. They've argued that this is a constant neutral relation. To me, it implies, they, they've even argued that this is not speech, period. Okay. Which so um, got all those tiers. I mean, it's it's tier. They say it's not speech. If it's speech, it's content neutral. If it's content based, we can satisfy strict scrutiny. They, they've argued the entire range of defense. I mean, this is what government lawyers do. And, and the court of appeals, did they pick one of those? Nothing. The majority just, opinion simply said on the PI, there was not a piece of discretion. The opinion was 12 pages long. Okay. And of the, that, three sentences were analysis. Most of it was simply reciting the facts and they blocked what this was analysis. They, they did not want no, And the dissent. Was 35 pages long and said this is a prior restraint of content based strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny. So very strong dissent. I mean, yeah, the cause was in my favor. But, but, but the, uh, the majority had literally three sentences of analysis and it was, uh, I don't think it's been locked in this court. And so what did the lower court say? Uh, the district court, um, the district court basically adopted the government's position saying that, well, uh, this is not content based, so under intermediate scrutiny, we uphold the content. How could it not be content? Um, are they, they're, not, they're not banning all computer code out of it. They're, they're, uh, I'll tell you later. Okay. It's, the, the, the district court opinion, I think, uh, did not give enough weight to the nature of the technology. And I think a few ways the government is characterized. The government, the government, to simplify, characterizes as an automatic process, right? That you click print and the gun comes out. Right, that this is like um, automatic code, whereas in reality this this is expressive. So the district court basically said because this is sort of automatic functional okay. code, there's not really any first amendment. Yeah, that's first what that, amendment. and that's why it's not content based. I, I think that is wrong as a matter of technology. We can argue the simplest thing. Yeah, Taylor. One last question. We have the three different high school and like this code you have a nice one because ours was expensive at the time, and I still. Like certain Cody has good stuff. Yeah, yeah he, he has a lab in Austin actually moved recently because they're not keeping up the supply. Um, but, but he has some pretty sophisticated technology. I went to his lab about a year or two ago. It's pretty cool. And he's selling stuff like that. Yeah. Like guns, okay. yeah. Yeah. What Cody's actually um, uh, what Cody's actually selling now is something called a ghost gun. And what's that? Remember I mentioned the 80% lower receivers that you can drill holes into? He built a jig. That if you put this 80% piece into this jig, it automatically drills all the holes in there. So it can basically turn an 80% lower to 100% lower. And he's selling these like hotkeys, he cannot keep up with them. They're, they're plastic, you mean? Well, no, no, these, 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 these are metal receivers. Yeah, right. but, but it's, it's the equipment to drill the holes right. automatically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, it can be interesting to see as this technology develops, you know. It certainly sounds to me like a prior restraint. Um, it's hard to get around that. It is information. I guess you can argue this. this no, it's not. It's just something that you send to a computer. It's, you know, but I'll on that. Cool. Well, we agree. Thank you all so much. I'm glad you came today. And uh, I'll be here for any further questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 I'll let you again in 30 minutes.